his website at Southwest Animal Hospital to read his credentials. I thought it would be just quick. Uh, he has a lot on there, so I'm going to try and summarize and stop me if I say anything wrong or if you want to add anything. Graduated from Oregon State University Veterinary School in 1986. And then he, he practiced over at Riley Hills, didn't you? Riley Hills, yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't even know if they're still, are they still there? They're still there, but they're a BCA clinic now, so they're not the same. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They used, yeah. Okay, and then in 1995, he decided to start his own practice, which is located at Murray and Allen in Beaverton. It's kind of in the back corner of a big shopping ship center. And he sees, in that practice, he sees 95% exotic animals and maybe 5% dogs and cats. So he is our number one top fellow doctor to uh, who knows about exotic. Um, reading through some of the things, he's, a, he's been a guest lecturer, he's been a rehabber of wildlife, he's been an instructor, and I don't know, some of these may already be current, but with Portland Community College and Oregon State University, are you still, still, that, yeah. still going down? Next two months I'm doing all those again. Yep. Are you? Okay. <clears throat> he's published different articles in, in different magazines on exotics. He's current, are you currently writing for new exotic textbook? Actually, the uh, yeah, the CV needs to be updated again. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that textbook's out. It was the Theriogenology Reproduction Textbook, which included rabbits and rodents and all sorts of species. Yeah. I did six chapters in that. Yeah. yeah. And um, so he's not just sitting around. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> outside of work, that is. Uh, yeah. And ferrets, just the ferret thing throughout his resume. I mean, he's done lots with ferrets. And of course, with all the other exotics as well, including rabbits. Um, so, any of you appeared on TV, you've been in newspapers, you were listed as one of the eight greatest ferret vets in the United States in the ferret magazine. Well. And so all of that is related to exotics. But he's also an author unrelated to specific things, and he has, you have a book out called, two books out. The first one is Dog Days and Cat Naps, A Vet Student's Odyssey. And what's the second one? The second one is science fiction. It has nothing to do with veterinary oh, medicine okay. whatsoever. <laughs> okay. <coughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Hold on a second here. There you go. Oh, 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 very cool. Very cool. And you have those for sale at your clinic. But they actually right? I have those at the clinic too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're mostly sold. Yeah, Are they? Yeah. Amazon okay. places, the yeah. Okay. Barnes and Noble. And I do know this about him. He likes cactus. Oh. Uh, his, he, I exotic have, plants, exotic animals, it all kind of makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a front yard full of cactus. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, and inside your clinic, there are cactus things. So, yeah. So with that being said, welcome. We really look forward to hearing all your information. Not think I'm busy enough as a veterinarian, working 10-hour days. So let's have a second job that doesn't really pay anything. So yeah, keeps me out of trouble, kind of. Um, but it's fun. It's actually more fun doing that than technical writing. But uh, and actually, that first one came out in 09, I think, or somewhere. And this one came out just last year. But Dog Days is still selling better. It still sells regularly online, and uh, science fiction ones not as much, but uh, they're fun, keep me out of trouble. So we're going to talk about bunnies today, and uh, specifically older bunnies, and really old rabbits are a lot like young rabbits, except maybe more frail, uh, but otherwise they're still the same critters, they still have the same basic needs, but there's things that do change with time. Um, <clears throat> the primary thing is probably is they're more prone to disease as they get older, uh, and they're also more prone to digestive upsets, which I guess is a form of disease, but they're more fragile that way, so we have to be more careful with their diet. Um, I've seen a lot of rabbits that were young, say, especially less than a year old, they were on atrocious diets and still never had a gut upset, uh, especially if they got a really sturdy bowel, and they do vary quite a bit between individuals. Um, and there's the common bad diet, like they're getting no hay, they're getting yogurt treats, they're getting half a banana a day, they're getting seeds and nuts, and they end up being obese sometimes, but also 
highly prone to gut upsets. I've had individuals like that that never had a gut upset, at least when they're young. The older they get, the more likely any kind of dietary variances are more likely to cause a bowel upset. <clears throat> um, I had a rabbit in uh, years ago that was supposedly about a year old. The owner had had it most of its life, so he got it when it was young. Um, obese, mineralized its kidneys. We ended up having to lose a kidney, actually, because it blocked one of them. But the reason was his diet. Uh, never had a gut upset. According to the owner, the only thing the rabbit ate for the whole year that he had it was meat and cheese. That was his oh, entire oh diet. Oh, God. <coughs> Why it didn't bloom and die the first day, I have no idea. Apparently, it had a really sturdy gut. But it did get obese from all the calories, and because of all the mineral content, it did mineralize his kidneys. But we managed to save one kidney. Got the rabbit on a normal diet. And did fine. But still, that's an extreme example of, yeah, sometimes when they're young, they'll put up with anything. And sometimes when they're old, you give them a piece of lettuce, and they get diarrhea and try to act up on you. So again, they are more fragile as they get older, regardless of what they were when they were young. Yeah. Could you just define old and young for the for <coughs> Well, there's here? a, I mean, I know there's it a varies, gradation, but... obviously. There's a gradation there, so it's not like one day they're old. Right. <laughs> but in general, as they're getting to be four or five and above, they're certainly going to be more prone to cancers and kidney disease and dental problems and infections and gut upsets. I mean, all those things, the first few years of life, maybe the first three, four years of life, they're not as prone to those things. And as they get to be four or five or above, you tend to get into the middle age to older category eventually as they get older and older. Uh, yeah, what defines an old, old mind? Well, I guess part of that could be defined by what's their average life expectancy. And if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have told you their average life expectancy was probably going to be five to seven. Um, these days, I'd probably tell you it's seven to 10. And we certainly, it seems like this past few weeks, we've had, it seems like, half the stuff we're getting in is over 10. I mean, it's like one after another, 10 years old, 12 years old. I mean, it's one after another. So obviously, as you get better understanding of their nutrition, probably particularly, and also their diseases, we are getting the age range pushed up further and further. And it's not because the rabbits have changed over time. It's more just their care has changed. Um, so we are getting better at getting to live past 10, but I won't guarantee somebody when they eat new rabbits can live past 10. I still think the average is probably lower than that, but certainly very achievable to get a 10 or 12 or even 13 year old sometimes. Um, oldest rabbit I've seen in, I can't verify, so it's not really the oldest rabbit. I had clients a few years ago that had brought a rabbit in, absolutely insisted the bunny was 19. No, no, and uh, no. <clears throat> I only saw it the one time. I, I, I've seen way too many cases where we knew how old it was, and somehow the owner added three or four years on as the animal got older. And you had to go back to the beginning chart when it was a baby and say, well, here it was this stage. You're like, oh, I guess that's right. You know, so but they both insisted they knew how old the rabbit was, knew what year they got it, and it was 19. If so, it's by far the oldest rabbit I've ever seen who was breathing. It looked old and decrepit, but it, you know, a 13 year old can look like that. So I really can't say I saw a 19 year old. I say I saw one they claimed was 19. <laughs> I've seen verified 13 more than once. I mean, that's, that's something we've seen. Beyond that, it's pushing pretty extreme. 24 of your cats, you can get one, but you're not likely to see one very often. So basically, yeah, if they're starting to get past four, we're getting into an age category where some rabbits may have trouble, and sometimes they look old and have a lot of old animal diseases by the time they're five. They just, some of them do. Um, and other ones will keep on trucking until they're 10 without too much problems. <coughs> Let's see, here's this. There we go. So you get <coughs> a lot of things that they carry when they're young they don't show up until they're older, or at least don't show up in a big way because their immunity gets weakened and they're more fragile, so things start taking advantage of them. If you get an encephalitozoan <coughs> case when they're eight years old or seven years old, they had that when they were a baby, probably too, most likely. <coughs> and it just was dormant for a long time because they were good at suppressing it. Same with respiratory diseases. A lot of them may have stuff they carry their whole life and they don't show it until they're a little older and they still finally start having more respiratory disease because they're more fragile. Sometimes that happens with dental problems. Well, Wear and tear and infections and all that stuff, with every species, dental problems are more of an older individual disease than a younger individual disease on average. Uh, metabolic problems, your organs start to act up. So your kidneys start, that big one would be kidney failure. But diabetes, where, you know, they can't make insulin anymore. I mean, there's various things that go wrong with the body as you age. And so if nothing else happens, well, you might end up with a, an organ failure type disease. Uh, cancers of all different types. You get mostly an old animal disease. Yeah, you can get lymphoma in a one-year-old bunny. But that's, the odds are it's more like a five-year-old, six-year-old buddy to worry about tumors, especially uterine cancer in females. Uh, and then, uh, again, your digestive upsets. It's always an issue to be aware of. It's always, you know, I wouldn't recommend people feed a half banana to a rabbit at any age, but doing an old animal is more likely to come back to haunt you. So you have to be more careful about their diet, more strict with what they eat as they get older. 
because that is a constant issue. So, you know, if you get older, you're more likely to see the bunnies that start having the, eye, the respiratory stuff, whether it be eye discharges or nasal or what have you. And they might have been fine when they're younger. Sometimes they'll have symptoms when they're young too, but uh, certainly when they're older, you're more likely to get the, the heavy eye discharges, the hair loss the, around the eyes, and, you know, more severe signs, harder to control them because they're more fragile. <clears throat> and these diseases aren't necessarily they don't occur in isolation. In other words, if you get a bunny who's um, older and has, say, early kidney disease, well, respiratory stuff's more likely to flare up too because their immunity's weakened. If there's anything else going wrong with their body, the infectious disease likes to take advantage of them. So, you know, they may have this going on, but what else is going on that we're not seeing? There could be other stuff sometimes because they're getting older. Uh, cataract formation, that's again, usually more of an older animal disease. It can be a young one occasionally, juvenile cataracts. And again, besides just age, there's other diseases that can cause this. So if they're diabetic, they're going to get cataracts in both eyes a lot of times. If they got a cephalozoan and it happens to target the lenses instead of the brain, and the parasite gets in the lenses, it will cause cataracts. So there's things we look for when we see these kind of things. It could just be age. And occasionally, you'll get a youngster that's got a cataract, doesn't have a cephalozoan, they just had bad lenses. I mean, stuff happens sometimes. Another cataract that's fine, but basically, these are not rare in rabbits, especially as they get older. So we're always looking for, you know, why. But age is a risk factor. And of course, you start seeing the, the weird funky teeth. Um, so, a little handlebar mustache there. And uh, you, know, you see these more, again, on older bunnies than you do on really young ones, usually, because they've had time to get the teeth damaged and beat up. And so, you get all sorts of interesting, wacky you know, dental uh, appearances when they get older. It's not too often we see a one year old bunny with this stuff. This is, you know, the, four, five, six, seven-year-old and up type diseases more commonly than it would be on a one-year-old. They start getting soiling of the urinary, uh, especially urinary soiling. If they've got diarrhea, fecal soiling, we've got to figure out why they got the diarrhea. But a lot of times they won't be having any diarrhea, but they're either kind of incontinent or they're not posturing very well when they urinate, so they're sitting down in it. You see it on the inside of the left feet there a little bit too, as well as the you know, general area. And again, more common to thing to see this stuff when they're aging, when they're middle age or older. And then it's a matter of trying to figure out why. Are they just incontinent or do they have, again, encephalozoan, which can make them really soil themselves because they lose control of the rear end, they lose control of the bladder. Some of these patients can be reverted back to normal if it is a parasitic problem like encephalozoan. You treat that, sometimes the soiling goes away. So it isn't always like this is how they're going to be forever. But you're more likely to see this in middle aged older rabbits. Um, so all these things are things, and again, you get the, <coughs> the urine that starts to get thicker. Um, Cloudy urine is one thing, but when it starts to get thick and clumpy, like on the left there, uh, it's getting excessively thick. And again, weakened bladder control, weakened bladder function. They're not emptying as well. This is, again, not a, not a young bunny problem, usually. So lots of stuff we see in the older kids that tends to be, you know, pretty common, and you don't see it too much in the one or two-year-olds. <clears throat> so what do you do as an owner to try to prevent these things, or at least manage older bunnies as best you can? Um, Biggest, one of the biggest things is simply be aware of what they're doing. Uh, if the bunny lives out in the hutch and people feed it, you know, every so often and aren't paying much attention to it, sometimes by the time we see them, they're a mess, literally. Um, so it helps if you actually are interacting in some way with them and you know what their normal behavior is. And if they're, not, if they're always eager to get their food and all of a sudden they're not eager to get their food anymore and they're not eating but half of it, then okay, there's an issue there. Regardless of what it is, it's important. Uh, if their energy level is way down compared to normal. If they're drinking three times as much water as normal, urinating a lot more than normal, well, okay, it's you know, better than, I guess, not drinking at all, but it's not normal, we'd be concerned about it, uh, especially sudden changes. <clears throat> now, sometimes people tell me, I'm concerned about a thirst because it drinks a lot of water. How long has it been doing that? Well, their whole life. You know, okay, you know, bunnies drink a lot sometimes, but you know, if it's always been that way, and the bunny's happy and healthy, I'm not worried about it. But they tell me it's drinking a lot more in the past month than it ever has before, and unless we're right in the middle of a heat wave or something, you know, I'd be worried about what's going on with the body. So. Um, weight changes, obviously. Now, again, gradual weight gain over time, we may just have to modify the diet, but sudden weight losses would bother me. They never want to voluntarily lose weight. Behavioral changes, too. So, I mean, those kind of things are things we're always looking for, and sudden changes that are persistent, not just a day or so, would bother me. Um, big thing is try to keep their diet real stable. Um, hay is nutritionally not got a lot in it, but that's exactly what they're designed to eat. So, you know, uh, you want fiber, most is going to come out the back end. They don't digest it, but that's actually good because it keeps their bowel stable, keeps their teeth worn down, keeps hair moving through the stomach. 
the lack of, the lack of nutritional content there is actually very useful. They're built to eat poor quality feed. So lots and lots of hay is very important, but especially as they get older, you want to make sure they're getting a lot of hay, only a little bit of goodies on the side, and, and really avoid things that aren't, uh, that don't approach a normal diet. In the wild, they mostly eat grasses. They don't dig carrots out of the ground. They don't eat fruits, as a rule. They might eat a few broadleaf greens, and that's about it. It's mostly grasses. I've watched bunnies, including domestic bunnies, that were wild, you know, raised. They've grown up in the wild, places where people have released a female or whatever, and there's a bunch of babies out there. And you watch what they eat as they eat, and they're all eating various grasses, and they're mostly ignoring everything else, and that's just mostly what they're eating. So they're grazing animal, of course. <clears throat> so the hay is very useful, partially because it mimics that diet of mostly fiber and a little bit of nutrition. Um, it's good to have a little bit of pellet in there, partially because using dried processed hays, the vitamin content's probably not going to be as good as it would be in fresh grasses. The variety of species they're going to eat is going to be a little more limited. So again, I'm not relying on the hay for all the trace vitamins and minerals. So a little bit of pellet, which will give you all that, is a good thing. Not enough to get them obese. And a lean pellet, definitely a Timothy-based low-protein pellet, not an alfalfa pellet, not a seed mix of all kinds of cracked corn, dried fruits, seeds in it. That's not even good for the young ones. A little bit of pellet, a lot of hay, a little bit of greens. And try to make sure, especially as they get old, that the hays are low-energy hays. Timothy hay, oat hay are probably the two lowest protein, highest fiber hays. Uh, meadow grass, it's okay. Orchard grass, really, really rich. <coughs> it's interesting, we have uh, <coughs> Oxbow's the brand of hays I carry, and they have nutrition labels on all their hays. The labels aren't right. And they're not right because it's almost impossible for them to make accurate nutritional labels because every harvest of hay they do is different, and they can't be bothering to test and relabel every batch of hay they sell. So they basically, as it turns out, they're averaging the labels, and they're actually averaging between different kinds of hays, too. Because <clears throat> like a couple years ago, two, three years ago, we have Timothy, oat, and orchard grass hay, and again, an orchard grass is a very rich hay. I don't use it, use it for most bunnies, but there's certain situations where we do. And whether they're allergic to other hays or they need to be on a low calcium diet where we get almost no pellets in there, then the richer hay is sometimes okay. But we have all three of those, oat, timothy, orchard grass. Two, three years ago, Oxbow's label said all three hays were 10% protein, which can't be right. I mean, orchard grass is a ton more rich than timothy, for instance. So even with variations there, the, the odds of them all being identical be pretty slim. <clears throat> then a year ago, this past year, all three labels said 7% protein. And again, yeah, there's some variation, but all three of them varying exactly the same from 10% to 7%. Yeah, we didn't, that, that can't be right. So we sent hay samples of all three of our hays from our hay bags to a lab that does hay analysis, nutrition analysis. And it turns out in our batches, the books say that on average, Timothy should be the lowest protein hay. And our batches actually came in second. Oat hay was the lowest protein hay. It came in at about 7.25% protein. Timothy came in at 9.25%. Orchard grass came in at 16.8%. It's richer than alfalfa hay. So basically, orchard grass and again, in the books agree too, it is the richest of the grass hay. It's supposed to average 10%. Our batch average is much higher than that. But the point is, it's a really, really rich hay. So basically, you want to probably maximize the lean hays, especially as bunnies get past four or five, and minimize the really rich ones, unless there's a specific reason we're doing it. And then we have to do it in a very careful way. So I don't use a lot of orchard grass. I have it on hand for certain patients, but I don't use a lot. I use Timothy and oat hay. Meadow grass isn't too much richer than, than oat hay. So there's several you can use, but just don't use a lot of orchard grass. Um, it's, it's like feeding them alfalfa hay, except less calcium. The alfalfa is high in calcium, too. Orchard grass is not a bad hay if you're dealing with bladder stone issues. Oat hay is even better, but orchard grass isn't a bad hay because it happens to be pretty low in calcium. Timothy is a high calcium hay, so, which is fine as long as they don't have bladder issues. But if they start developing poor bladder function in older life, we sometimes have to yank them off Timothy hay and put them on oat and or orchard grass because they happen to be low calcium hay. So protein is one thing, calcium is another, and they don't relate to each other at all. Mm. Alfalfa is high in both. Timothy is high in calcium and low in protein. Orchard grass is high in protein, low in calcium. And oat hay happens to be low in both calcium and protein. You just kind of have to know those hays to decide what do you use. And that's my job, figuring out what we do in certain situations to help the bunny. We don't want to get gut upsets while we're trying to prevent bladder stones. You know? So but, uh, in general, I'd be careful with orchard grass and alfalfa. And some of the other grass hays aren't so, so bad. Uh, <clears throat> when they get older, and again, four to five and up especially, Pretty good idea to do regular veterinary exams. We don't have any vaccines for them. We're not going to be vaccinating them or immunizing them. I wish we did have vaccines for them, but we don't. Um, so we're mostly looking at just trying to find things that may be going on with them. How's their mouth looking? Uh, as they get older, 
the first few years, I usually just do an annual exam, and I'm just doing a physical exam. I'm usually, it's like a 20-year-old person. We're usually not doing a lot of blood tests, not doing a lot of urinalyses, unless there's a specific problem in the reporting, and we need answers. Otherwise, they're a routine exam, they check out physically fine, they're two and a half years old, that's probably all we're going to do. Say, okay, is there weight where we want it? Do we need to decrease their pelvis a little or something if they're getting heavy? There's no other obvious signs of problems, they're fine. They get to be about that age, um, start worrying about what are the things that I can't see. So again, a 45-year-old person goes in for a medical exam, they may end up doing a blood profile because you're 45, not because there's a specific problem that you're telling them about. It's more like, well, you're getting to an age where stuff starts to change and we can't see it all on the outside. We can feel things, we can look at things, and I can probably do that better than the average owner. I'll, we'll find things on exam sometimes that the owners didn't pick up. But I can't tell you what their kidney function is by eyeballing them. I can't tell you what their white blood cell count is, or their blood sugar, or a lot of other things just by looking at them. So whether they think they have an illness or not, if they get to an age where it's not really obvious, then we, the other half of the coin is do a blood screen and or urine and see if they've got early changes in their kidneys or things like that we might want to address. Um, and the other thing is when they get really getting up there two past five, bunnies age fast enough that a year is a long time for a seven-year-old bunny. Might not be quite as long for a seven-year-old cat. Uh, so because of their lifespan being constricted a little bit more, typically species like bunnies and guinea pigs and ferrets and so on, especially rats, um, every six-month exam is probably better when they get older. I'm not too worried about when they're two, but when they're four or five, a lot changes in a year. That's basically a big chunk of their lifespan compared to a human. So doing a one-year exam on older bunnies, kind of like a person going in once every five years for an exam, you, you may miss stuff in that half a decade. You know? So basically, not a bad idea to do them a little closer together when they get old. And blood profiles, and actually your analysis too, mostly looking for kidney stuff on the urinalysis, although it will pick up diabetes as well, and it will pick up bladder problems as well on urine. Um, but you know, just try to cover your bases and hope you find anything early if there is. Now these days, if you got an animal with, say, kidney disease, and you catch it before they're in total failure, there are things you can do for those patients to try to prolong life to kidneys. One would be make sure they're on a fairly low protein diet, maybe even lower than normal, as long as they're not getting too skinny. Run them on the slender end of normal and try to reduce the protein load in those kidneys so they, they last longer. The other thing is omega-3 fatty acids. You can supplement those at high level. They've actually been shown to reduce kidney damage and kidney disease, at least in other species like dogs and cats. That's one of the latest and greatest. I was just at the veterinary conference and they were really pushing omega-3s for kidney patients, you know, so basically, and for certain other things too. Uh, inflammatory diseases, arthritis, certain types of lung disease, so coat and skin problems. Um, so basically, I, I got an earful, I was interested in that anyway, but I got an earful of, you know, how much variance there is in the, in the omega-3s on the, in the, the market and which ones are more absorbable and which ones are less absorbable and, and how high the doses actually have to be to actually get you to where you want to be. I mean, if you're the average human taking omega-3s and you're taking fish oil, which is the most common form of it, only a third of that is actually the omega-3s you want. So if you've got a 1,000 milligram capsule, you're getting about 300 milligrams of the fish oil of the things you actually want. And the dose is high enough, the average person needs to take like 4,000 milligrams a day to get a decent dose, which is what my mom's on because she had her eye problems and the ophthalmologist told her, well, your eyes, she's 90, you know, and her eyes are dried out, so no tears. So, Take 4,000 milligrams of fish oil a day, your tear flow will come back. Sure enough, she's got nice moist eyes again. But that's the dose she had to take to have any effect because you're getting only 30% of that. And so sure enough, she takes two in the morning, two in the evening, and her eyes are fine. It's also recommended for things like preventing, you know, reducing your risk of heart attacks and cholesterol issues and all that. But it turns out you have to take a lot of the, just if you just get fish oil. There are pure fatty acid formulas out there in the veterinary side, at least, that have gotten rid of all the oil and other stuff and just has the two fatty acids that you want, DHA and EPA in high concentration. They're a little more expensive capsules, but you take far fewer of them per day. So that's those things are out there now. You have 3V snip tips for dogs, you know, which are little capsules that you can actually break open and want to put on their food. And those things are, you know, pure fatty acid without all the oils and other stuff in it. So the amount, it's like 90% of the actual weight is actually the fatty acids to 30%, so you don't take as many. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that that they're coming out with. And so, again, we found an animal that had early stage kidney disease. Either we see excess protein in the urine or the concentration in the urine is getting weak, it's not concentrated anymore. They might not be in total kidney failure, they might still feel pretty good, be eating. We might be able to do things to kind of halt that disease process or greatly slow it down. Won't make the kidneys young again, but they might last a couple years longer. So, you got to figure out they got kidney problems before doing that though. So, that's why the blood and urine comes in useful when they're getting older. Exercise and good diet. Well, exercise and money is a relative term. You know, 
if it was a dog I was talking about here, I'd be talking about, well, they need to go on a long walk on a leash every day. I doubt you're going to get your bunny to go on a mile long walk on a leash. Yes. Just not likely to happen. So basically exercise, yeah, we don't want them penned up all the time. They get out and roam around the house. If they're an older rabbit, they're going to be lazier anyway, usually not doing cartwheels and leaping all over and doing stuff they did when they were one year old or six months old and being silly. I mean, they're probably going to be slower. But just getting out, stretching their legs, not only for quality of life, but also because, yeah, it does exercise is a good thing. Keeps their weight down, keeps them feeling good, um, keeps the gut moving. And then good diet, again, same thing we talked about, trying to prevent gut problems will also prevent obesity. A lean diet's not going to make them fat. Greens and a small bit of pellets and hay, if it's a lean hay, you eat that all day long, you're not going to get heavy. I mean, it's hard to get heavy on salad when there's no dressing on it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's one of those things that you can manage their weight easily if they're on a good diet. Yeah. So we do have a, a five-six-year-old rabbit, and how do you recommend giving him exercise? Because he doesn't want to leave his home. You can stick him outside and talk to him. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a tough one because all you can do on those individuals is probably indoors where he's not going to get freaked out right. running around or something. But you, you take him out, put him as far away from his home as you can, at least make him walk back okay. there repeatedly. <laughs> you do what you can to try to get a little exercise. You know? we, we see that with reptiles, too. A lot of things like tortoises are very shy. And, you get them out, they just want to make a beeline for somewhere like under a chair where they can hide and they stop. And you got to keep pulling back to the middle of the room because they just they don't want to roam around. They just go and stop as soon as they think they're hidden. And it's hard to get them to stretch their legs much if they're shy ones. So you do what you can. I mean, you don't want to stress them out severely. You don't want to be putting them along trying to make them go. But you know, you try to get a little bit of exercise best you can. And maybe he gets out and gets held a little bit or something. Just leaves out of his environment a little bit. But you know, yeah, if they really don't want to, it's hard. It, most bunnies like to do stuff, but some of them don't. Um, and then female rabbits, unless they're a breeder rabbit, obviously if you're going to breed them, they have to have the uterus there. If you're not breeding them, I'd probably lose that uterus and ovaries because they get an awful lot of cancer problems with that reproductive system. It's just not a part of their body that ages well. And it's particularly bad for rabbits. I mean, each species is different. <coughs> if you had a rat, mammary tumors are their big thing. Like female rats get tons of mammary tumors. If they're spayed, they get less. So guinea pig, it's mostly ovary problems. They get cystic ovaries. Some of them are like, you know, that big around. Uh, but they cause hormonal problems, they go bald, they start getting pot belly and lose muscle mass. I mean, it messes them up hormonally, but not as many cancers. But yeah, you do get uterine cancer in rats once in a while and in guinea pigs. But the biggies in, in those species are different. In rabbits, you get mammary tumors occasionally and you get cystic ovaries occasionally, but the biggie is the uterine cancer and uterine infections. If you spay them, though, the ovary problems go away too, the uterine problems go away, and the mammary tumor problems mostly go away. So all three of those areas are hit by just knocking the hormone levels down. The, yeah. I'm sorry, how common is testicular cancer? Is that an issue? Uncommon. Uh, Uncommon? Okay. In fact, in males, of most species, other than maybe dogs, because dogs have a prostate and they have prostate disease when they get older, weirdly enough, dogs also get tumors around the anus, which are hormonally induced. So old male dogs get this ring of tumors around the anus, and they're technically not malignant, but they get big, they ulcerate and bleed, it's painful death case, it's right there, and removing is literally a pain in the butt. I mean, they are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's right in the anal area, you have to cut these tumors out, and they bleed, and they're sore. I mean, I've done plenty, plenty of perianal tumor removals, but they often get new ones, so old dogs that aren't neutered have hormonal-related issues, even though they don't get testicular cancer much, but the prostate and the anal area have problems. <clears throat> uh, most other species, well, in ferrets, we almost never see an intact ferret anyway, they're neutered by the breeders, but like rabbits and rats and stuff, you just don't see a lot of reproductive related disease in male animals. The one we would see is rabbits, once in a great while they do get testicular tumors, but their seminomas, and weirdly enough, they don't know why, they often get them in both testicles. They didn't spread from one or the other, they just get them in both testicles. So obviously something stimulates them to happen, but they are not malignant in the sense of a Lance Armstrong type testicular tumor. It's not going to end up in their lung and their brain like he had. He's very fortunate to be walking around with truth because he had a disease that really should have killed him. By the time he discovered he was coughing up blood, he had lung medicine, and he also had one in his brain. You know, I mean, he should have died. But basically, these kind of things, the testicle just gets big and keeps getting bigger. And so you have to rename your rabbit to be Chinese, like Wan Hong Lo, because it gets big. Wan Hong Carlo, it's really big. But basically, they, they do. They, some of them get, it's amazing how big rabbit testicular tumors can get, but they don't spread to other parts of the body typically. So if you get an older male that wasn't neutered, and one testicle starts to get big, sometimes they both get big, sometimes the other one kind of shrivels up a little bit because it just seems to happen. But I mean, they oftentimes are off lopsided. But if they get one or both testicles getting large, you can still neuter them then, assuming they're a stable individual. The testicle isn't, it's just big, and so they're not dangerous, dangerous. So average lifespan on a male, assuming you can put up with any behaviors he has, like spraying on things or whatever, but they're often neutered for behavioral reasons. But if they're a nice bunny, they don't seem to need neutering, 
probably gonna live about the same length of time whether they're neutered or not. The female bunny is a different story, and it doesn't mean all of them are gonna get problems. I had a 13-year-old in a while back, still had a uterus, mm -hmm. still didn't have any lumps in it, best I could palpate, and she was 13, so she obviously either was just lucky or didn't have a high tendency for it, so they can live to be old age with the uterus, but playing the odds, you know, up to 80% of them get uterine cancer if they live to be five, six, seven years old, so that's pretty high odds of you're gonna have problems. In fact, compared to most other species, it's pretty steep. So I, I tell you, yeah, if they're not going to be a breeder animal, or they were and they're done breeding, and you want them to live to be really old, your best bet is to do it without the uterus. They're more likely to match the males in terms of longevity. Otherwise, the odds are, and, you know, and we can spay them when they're older if they come in with the uterine mass. But the problem is, uterine tumors in rabbits aren't like testicular tumors. They do spread. And they get aggressive. They go places sometimes. So by the time we see them, they're internal where owners aren't likely to notice them unless it's huge and sticking out. I mean, these things are in the belly where it's kind of hard to see anything unless you palpate carefully. Mm -hmm. So by the time owners bring them in because they're sick from uterine cancer, mm -hmm. it usually means it's gone beyond the uterus because mm -hmm. uterine tumors and uterine infections are kind of sneaky because the uterus isn't a vital organ. It's there for reproduction. It isn't there to maintain your normal day-to-day -day functions like the kidneys and the liver. So mm -hmm. you can mess up the uterus big time and have the rabbit still say, well, I feel pretty good because all the other organs are working. Once it gets into the liver or other places or into the bowel that's blocking a bowel and they act sick, it's often because it's gone everywhere. So we can't fix all of those. We get in there and try to take a tumor out, it's like, well, you got 10 more of them in the liver. Well, we can't fix that. If it stays in the uterus and we catch it well, maybe it just, say, has hemorrhage one day. The tumor bleeds and they have some vaginal discharge, some blood, but it hasn't spread anywhere else. We catch it while it's still in the uterus. We can cure a high percentage of those. Uh, but once it's beyond that, it's it's tough. So really rather do when they're young and healthy than old and sick. But we get one that's five years and has never been spayed. We've had quite a few masks that we have taken out successfully. Uh, so, you know, we basically want happy bunnies um, that live to be a ripe old age and do it pretty comfortably. And you can't prevent everything. I mean, you can do the best job in the world. Some bunnies aren't going to get past seven or eight. I mean, it's just, you know, they run into things like catastrophic dental problems when they're four years old and just have a lot of dental abscesses and things. That can take time off of them no matter what you do. And, some of those aren't even curable totally. So, you have to, like people or dogs or anybody else, you're going to get to be 100 years old. You have a little bit of luck. It's not care how good your medical care is. A lot of people simply don't have it in them to get to be 100. In fact, probably most people don't. Um, the average longevity keeps going up. But these, even these days, I can't reliably say I'm going to get to 100 no matter how well I take care of myself. It's just beating the odds a little bit. Um, on the other hand, if you're going to get to that ripe old age, you got to do things right. Uh, I don't know, George Burns smoked cigars his whole life, still lived to be 100. Maybe he lived to be 106 if he didn't smoke, but who knows, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you have a little bit of luck and you're just, you're just hardy as can be and you just, you know, you avoid major problems as you go and, and the other people take good care of themselves and don't get past 75. So, I mean, you just never know. But you do the best you can and uh, we are seeing the benefits of that because we are seeing animals, even, I say, even just compared to 15 years ago, I've been around long enough now, unfortunately, that, you know, I've seen a lot of change when I first got out of practice. Bunnies, say five to seven was about it typically. Uh, and so we really are seeing increases there. We're not quite doubling that, but certainly we're getting up there. And that's not because they're that different genetically than what they were in the 1980s or 90s. It's because they're better understood and we're doing a better job, especially with diet. I mean, that's the thing I'm always harping on people. You know, I, I still see cases where they've seen three other veterinarians before they saw me and the diet's still crummy. It's like, did nobody address the diet here? You know, <laughs> so let's get that fixed because I want it to live longer. Uh, he was not in for a gut problem, it's in for something else entirely, but <clears throat> I won't even, Mary probably knows me, I won't even do a spay or a neuter on uh, a normal, healthy young rabbit if I haven't seen the clients at least once. Because I want to find out what the heck they're feeding before I schedule a surgery, because if that needs to be fixed, I'm not going to schedule a surgery until it's fixed. I don't want to get them in the day of surgery and find out, oh, they're getting fruit, they're getting you know, all kinds of other stuff, and that makes them inherently unstable. Their gut's always a little bit tweaked by that. Now we do anesthesia on them and stress them to surgery and maybe they bloat after surgery or have a gut problem. We have very, very few complications like that, but one of the reasons we have very few complications is I'm very, very particular about what are you doing at home, you know. And also silly things. People have had dogs before. Oh, we fasted the bunny overnight, you know, for surgery. No, you, you, you don't need to do that. You know, they can't vomit anyway. Why fast them? It's a dog thing. And also it distresses their gut. Now you've got animals going to surgery after already being fasted for half a day, which is not their norm. And so now they've got empty gut that can get stressed easily. So we went to the meeting, and literally with rabbits, because they can't vomit, um, we really literally feed them right up until they go under anesthesia. We have to pull hay out of their mouth to get them on the mass, that's fine, but really they're literally eating right up until they go under anesthesia. And as soon as they're on their feet enough, 
so they're not going to take headers into the hay pile. They got food in their cage after anesthesia too, and some of them are eating 20 minutes after a spay or dinner. They're quick recovery patients, so I'm back there eating again, which is great. That's what we want. So you just have to not treat them like dogs or cats. They aren't. You really have to be aware of what to do with them. But but we are getting better. I mean, seen tons of 10-year-olds lately. We didn't used to see that. So. I don't know if we'll get them to live the 20 ever. I mean, you know, it's a 19-year-old, I think, is still going to be the extreme exception, if it was real at all. But at least we're getting them to the maximum of what we can, giving them a happy life. It's not like they're spending the last half of their life as a crippled, decrepit animal, either. I mean, they're usually doing pretty well up to the time they finally can't go any further. Some of them are rickety and stuff, but they're usually pretty good quality of life, I think, most of the way, and that's what we want. We don't want animals that are just hanging on to see how long they can hang on. they got to not be having to be force-fed constantly. They need to be eating and drinking on their own. And, mobile enough where they can still do some things they like to do. I don't care if they're fast anymore, but they got to be able to you know, not be stuck in one corner all day long and be force-fed to keep them alive. They need to be happy kids. So when we're talking about increased longevity, we're talking about increased quality of life longevity, not just how far can we push them in the, you know, with fluids, supplemental fluid injections, and all this stuff. We're not, that's not our long-term approach. Um, well, I did have a... Uh, <laughs> there was a picture at the very end there of a cactus, but uh, there it is. <laughs> so, it's from my old cactus garden, the previous house. I got a bigger garden now, but same type. A lot of kinds of plants there. They are pretty when they bloom. They're still kind of sad looking this time of year, but when they get happier, it gets warm, and they come back to life and they bloom. Uh, usually April, May, June, right in there is when they're blooming. And I have about 200 varieties out in the yard now, so I have lots of different colors and lots of different things. So that just keeps another way to keep me out of trouble. Plus it keeps the, the streakers out of the front yard, too. <laughs> <laughs> Not a place you want to go. Uh, in fact, even the raccoons don't go in the front yard much anymore. These do, but they kind of um, avoid it now. <laughs> the plants have gotten bigger. Blow up in our rain? Yeah, well, you got to have the right kinds. Um, and you got to have a sand, you know, sandy soil and mm -hmm. elevated beds, preferably, so it drains. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of things I can't grow here. So you, you can grow a lot of prickly pears, you can grow a lot of choyas. We have about 20 varieties of choyas now. Uh, probably. 80 varieties of trigger pears. You can grow yuccas and agaves to some degree, some agaves, lots of yuccas. Um, and you can grow um, some small barrel cacti, hedgehog cacti. But you can't grow sorrows in big barrels. Some things I'd really like to grow, you just can't. They rot. And it's not always the cold, it's the wet. Um, there's cacti in New Mexico and places like that that gets far colder in the winter than it does here because they're high elevation plants. Or a lot of stuff in South America in the Andes is at 10,000 feet. I'll guarantee it gets colder there at times than it does here usually. But it's dry cold, and that's what the combination of wet month after month, especially like from November through April, it's just raining all the time. That plus 40 degree temperatures will kill a lot more plants than zero degrees would for great periods of time in dry conditions. So, uh, yeah, unless I want to cover all of them in heat, in which I don't, it's like you know, survival of the fittest. You either, I don't baby them too much, you either survive or I replace it with something else, you know. And so I do have occasionally have a few that die on a given winter, a couple of things die, and I'll replace them. But the yards get pretty stuffed full now. I have almost no room for anything new. The plants have gotten big, and a lot of them are as tall as I am. And, you know, it just used to be, my, my wife uh, mentions when she first met me, you know, it was like five years ago. She goes, I really didn't know what you were doing with your yard because there's these big expanses of rock and these little plant here and there with these huge spaces between them. I was like, why so much space between them? And she goes, now I understand because they're little plants that become really big. And I knew what they were going to be, so I gave them room, and now they're it's almost hard to even get out in the yard. You don't want to fall over in a cactus garden. That's not. <laughs> you, know, you definitely don't want to fall over. So it kind of winds your way between them and not get stuck with them. And, but they're uh, they're neat. I grew up in southern Oregon, so down there it's much more of a California type climate. Um, you do have seasons down there, but it's much drier. Medford's got half the rain we do here, and so people sometimes have plants like this in their gardens here and there, not the majority. <clears throat> so I started collecting when I was in high school. I saw them, and asked for people for cutting, get a plant here, a plant there, and I started collecting them there. And I moved up here. I thought, well, might as well try it. And it turns out if you do the right things with the soil stuff, you can get a lot of them to survive even here. So, yeah. You eat the pads? <clears throat> All the fruits are edible off cactus. Um, and, and the pads are, technically, some of the prickly pear pads are edible too. But the fruits are actually quite tasty. The problem is getting around the spines and, and peeling properly. The, the, the ones they raise commercially for fruits, um, the tuna as they call them, uh, are big giant prickly pears with great big fruits and, and there's a lot of pulp in those. These plants, when they get fruits on them, they're much smaller fruits and yeah, I've tasted them before and they actually taste okay, but they're big hard seeds you can't chew up. I mean, they're hard seeds and that's 90% of the contents. There's a little bit of pulp and juice around it. Like, this is almost none of it that's edible other than it's mostly these hard seeds you have to spit out. So it's really, 
Like you took a super seedy grape and made it 10 times seedier. So the taste is sweet, but getting around the spines and getting the small amount of pulp out of them, it's not really worth, I think, for these species to do it. Um, but uh, the tech is very edible. And yeah, I, I don't go that effort. It's just too much effort, too much prickly spines to bother. So. But yeah, it keeps me out of trouble. And so, again, it's actually a little maintenance yard once they're done because they don't grow that fast. You don't have to prune them very much. And if you put the right rock down, the landscape fabric down, so you don't have to, you really don't want to weed around them once they get big, pain weeding. So I try to, this, this garden here, I just had sand down. You see moss is starting to grow on the sand and weeds will start sprouting up. And I and found out over the years that that's put a piece of landscape fabric down after you plant the plants and then put gravel over that. And it really knocks down the weed and moss growth. So it's just low maintenance. In fact, technically, you don't have to even water them if you don't want to. I do have a sprinkler system. I water them once a week in the summer so they stay green and look happy. But really, you didn't have to water them. And you don't have to really weed and don't have to prune. There's no lawn mowing. So I mean, it is actually, once it's done, it's actually a pretty low maintenance yard. So we I have people coming around taking pictures in the spring. What's that? So we should do cactus instead of rabbits. Yeah. <laughs> Still put your reps in the cactus care. garden. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, if you want to do something that was eco-friendly in the sense of low water usage, desert gardens are really, really low water usage. You would, technically wouldn't have to water them at all any time of year if you didn't want to. They would, if you've ever been to the desert in the summer, they don't look happy. They shrivel up and look a little sad, but they would live. And so in this climate, they easily would make it through summer with no water. But I tend to want to keep them green and growing. And they grow better and flower better if they get some water. So I do water them sparingly during the summer. Winter time, there's no water except Mother Nature, and that's still more than I would want. But, but yeah, they, they live. I've had them now for, oh, I started that garden in 1990-ish, and my current garden, when I moved to this house, was 2004. So they've been in the ground for nine years in the current house now. You know, you just play this bag down. So I had rabbits in there for eight years on that. And yeah. how do you talk to these people? It's, it's like, like, you know, people people, people sometimes them. live 80 years when they smoke. It doesn't mean smoking's good. It does increase your health risks. So it's not, and, and again, they vary. Some rabbits have a cast iron gut that nothing seems to bother. Even when they're older, sometimes they get away with stuff. Uh, but on average, your risk of ending up seeing me, because they've got emergency gut patient, is much higher if they're on, you know, 90% of the gut patients I see are first time clients, you know, because they're feeding them wrong. Once they've seen me, if they listen anyway, they're not going to have as many gut upsets, and I don't see them over and over with the same problems usually. It's usually, as soon as I see a chart, you know, acute loss of appetite, depressed, so on. High percentage of those are first-time clients. They just are feeding them crud, you know. And so, yes, some of them are ones that we've seen before, and they are doing a good job with diet, and they still get gut upset as they get older. But all you can do is just try to pound it. You know what? That's a lucky bunny. But there's, we see a lot of problems with bunnies with, with dietary issues, and again, the risk gets older, more as they get older. So the other thing they'll say oftentimes, well, I've done it for three years, the bunny's fine. Yeah, that's the first three years of their life. The next three years may not be so happy. It's just like people, you know, when you're 80 years old, you don't tolerate the pepperonis as well as you when you're 20. Difference is in human, that's a nuisance disease, and a little rabbit, that's a life-threatening disease if you get a gut upset. So you just have to kind of just tell them, you know, the risks go up as they get older, and each bunny's different, but they all are at least, at least a little at risk when they're eating weird things in the diet that they shouldn't. Would you address the obesity issue as well? Yeah, obesity in rabbits typically, again, means their diet's not quite ba balanced properly. <clears throat> and automatically, too, an obese bunny is at higher risk for gut upsets. Because even if it's just too much pellet, maybe there's nothing, maybe there's no items in the diet that are inappropriate. Maybe it's hay, and it's the right kind of hay, pellets, and a little bit of greens, but they're getting a cup of pellet a day, or at least half a cup, that'd be plenty in a lot of cases to do it. And they're eating all that. Well, in that case, if the pellet's a low-protein pellet, and they're just simply eating too much, it's still an inappropriate diet because it's energy-rich to the point where it's exceeding their needs. That's why they're storing away as body fat. So a bunny who's on a high-energy diet, regardless of how they got that energy, automatically are at higher risk for gut upsets because it's going to energy overload that cecum. You've got more chance of bloating. You want the diet to be lean because it favors the gut staying stable. So basically, an obese rabbit is a risk patient for gut problems. And so you get the weight down gradually by usually cutting pellets so it amounts to it's usually too much pellet. Now, yeah. Do you also see more, um, more arthritis in obese rabbits or other That's a tough one because they're, they're not <coughs> terribly prone to arthritis compared to, say, 90-pound dogs or humans. <laughs> Because they're smaller. Um, but yeah, if they're heavy, they're certainly going to act older, creakier when they get older, whether they have a lot of arthritis or not. I mean, simply a lot of effort to move that weight around. They tend to get more sedentary and lazier, which makes them gain more weight. And they get more soil underneath because they're sagging down into the urine and stuff. You know, sometimes they really sag down. So you get more, yeah, they don't look as good when they're older in terms of perky, healthy, because they're lethargic, they're soiled a lot of times. Uh, if they do have any arthritis tendencies, weight really will exaggerate and make it worse. 
we do get some bunnies that do benefit from anti-inflammatories. They act like they are through. They can, yeah, if you lose weight on those kids and get them back to normal weight, they have a lot less weight to carry on those joints and they feel better. So they have dogs too. It's a lot more common in dogs. And big dogs that are heavy are just really high arthritis risk candidates when they get old, you know. You know Labrador's carrying 20 extra pounds. You just ask them for hip problems when they get older. Even if they got great hips when they're young, you get a lean big dog, you're more likely to be at least mildly arthritic, arthritic or be able to manage it when they're not crippled from it. So, yeah, I mean, obesity, first thing I think of, though, on any age bunny is obesity means they're on too much energy intake. That means they're also at risk for gut problems at any time. Let's get both those things fixed and gradually get their weight down. Don't crash diet them. Um, <clears throat> dogs can crash diet. They're built to kind of gorge and then not eat for a week because they hunt packs. But cats and rabbits that are animals that eat small, frequent meals, really aren't built to store up body fat and then burn a ton of it all at once. And so if you take a heavy animal and make them lose weight quick, or they get ill and stop eating and they're losing weight quick, you have a real problem with their body not being able to handle all that body fat. Because essentially what happens when they go off food or they're losing weight too fast is now they're on an extremely high fat diet because they're burning body fat for energy. That's what they're living on. So it's just like you're feeding them pure fat. I mean, it's a high fat diet. It won't upset their gut because it's not really going through the gut, but it will cause liver problems for them. And uh, once you take fat out of storage up from under your skin and put it in the bloodstream to digest, the liver has to process that fat and get it towards burnable energy from the body. Dog livers are really, really efficient at taking a high amount of body fat very quickly and metabolizing it and not having any problem with that. Animals like cats and rabbits, um, if they put a whole bunch of fat into the bloodstream quickly, and of course their normal diet, there wouldn't be much fat in the bloodstream even after a meal. It's not like you eat a hamburger and your blood actually turns white for a while, you know, or a dog eats dog food and you take a blood sample afterwards and their blood's actually cloudy white from all the fat in it. Oh. You know, but dogs are built to do that. You, know, you do that with a rabbit and their blood's lipemic, you tend to have that liver get literally clogged with all the incoming fat. It can't process it fat enough. And if you have an animal losing weight fast and they're obese, their liver actually turns color. It's actually a greasy yellow color instead of normal brown because all the fat's stuck in it actually swells up. And that will cause liver to not function properly. You'll get sick from it. We basically call it fatty liver disease, but essentially it's, the liver's not permanently damaged, but while it's clogged with fat, it doesn't work right, and you feel sick like you have liver disease, and guess what? They want to eat even less then, so it can become a downhill spiral. So you really want to, it's true with almost anybody, but you want to lose weight steadily but gradually and not crash diet for most most cases, and you're more likely to stay healthy while doing it. Also, bunnies are less likely to grow mad at you because they don't feel like they're being starved. They're getting gradually decreased food intake where it's not quite as bad from their standpoint. You know, they feel like they're all of a sudden got nothing to eat. So basically, you know, usually you're going to blame not the hay, unless it turns out to be really rich hay. You always check that. But it's usually going to be the pellet and or if it's a seed nut mix, the nuts and stuff, we're really going to put weight on them. So you figure out where the calories are coming from. You say, okay, that's the part of diet we're going to gradually cut back. They can still have unlimited hay. They can't be fasting. So they can eat hay all day long, but they're going to cut back the pellet or whatever else they're on. If it turns out they're on alfalfa pellet and they're seven years old, let's try to put them on a timothy pellet. Maybe they did the amount the same for now. See what happens when they're on a pellet that's got a lot lower protein. If that doesn't do the trick, then we'll gradually, slowly cut the pellets back. And people are often surprised how little pellet a rabbit needs, especially when they're old and they don't do a lot. You know, they may only need a teaspoon of pellet twice a day in some cases, if they're an extreme example. A small bunny that doesn't do a lot, that's old. Uh, sometimes they need a tablespoon or more, but it really is not going to be like a half a cup, probably. It's going to be a little less than that. And so sometimes you can get down to really small amounts of pellet and keep them lean. I just tell people, hey, you're saving on your food bill at the same time. You know, that's about the only thing in medicine you can do that actually saves you money while making the animal healthier. It's cutting their food back. Everything else usually costs money. It's medicine or it's whatever, you know. No, this is the one case where we're actually going to save money and actually they're healthier at the same time. You're putting less money on pellets. So, yeah. Uh, my boy's about eight, and I kind of need to act a little more, but I've noticed his ears also have been a little touch. Is that typical when he's not moving? It could just be, yeah, not moving as much, or his metabolism may have slowed a little bit with age and, you know, circulation. So, and that's the extremities are really sensitive to circulation and stuff. So, if he's not showing any other signs of disease, it probably is, yeah, he's older, he's cooler. I mean, people, people complain about that when they're 75, too. It's like, Jim, cold, it used to be cold when I was 30, you know, well, yeah, your metabolism slowed down a little bit, and but make sure he's acting normal, he's not changing the weight, he's not, you know, showing any other signs of problems. I mean, <clears throat> he's not looking, turning blue or anything like that. I mean, he looks like a normal bunny, except his ears are cooler. Uh, that's probably just because he's not got quite the metabolic rate he did when he was younger. That's okay. Yeah. I would love if you or somebody here could show us how do you pick up a rabbit, especially one that does not want to be really flighty. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the key things are you don't want to hurt the rabbit and you don't want to hurt yourself. And rabbits can hurt you a little bit. I've got a nice scar on my arm here that runs from here to here from a bunny about this size that decided to kick the crap out of my arm. 
uh, and just on a routine exam, just freaked out. And you know, it, I either let it leap off the table into the wall, or you hold on to it and try to get a grip on it, in which case it managed to kick my arm two or three times real nice and left a big, deep gouge that left the scar. I tell people it's from wrestling a bobcat, it sounds more impressive. <laughs> but buddy rather beat me up. But, you know, basically, yeah, you don't, you, don't to, you don't want to get, you know, you don't want to get kicked by them, but you also don't want them hurt themselves, usually by kicking. Whether it be tearing a nail out, you know, tearing a toenail out, or breaking their back. Look at that scar. Oh. It's hard, hard to see it in this light, but... Yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, wow. But uh, that's the only, it's the only permanent mark I've ever gotten in practice from wherever. I've got, you know, my finger is pretty much gone. I had the guano almost take my finger off. My scar from that is pretty much gone now. I think she's got the feeling back in pretty well, too. But, yeah, mostly, I, the types of animals we work on are really safer than dogs and cats. We don't really worry too much unless it's a... It has to be something really new. Well, big cats. I suppose the big cats are a pain in the neck. You know, you got links in or something. They don't really want to be your your buddy. Uh, and they got weapons. But uh, really, other than big cats, most of the stuff we see, even things like alligators, they're easier to work on than a Rottweiler. Really, I mean, you know, you know what you're doing with them. They're, they're easier. So we really don't worry too much about getting injured. In what we do, because most of our patients are small, and a lot of them are herbivores, which are inherently not don't have the weapons that the carnivores have anyway. But uh, you know, I don't care how big a ferret is. It's nowhere near the size of even a small dog. And they want to bite you, it's more like, you know, don't do that, uh, as opposed to they're going to take my finger off. So we really, these patients are pretty safe. But the main thing with rabbits is you don't want them to hurt themselves. Um, and so you have to restrain those back legs properly and not let them kick themselves into oblivion. Uh, if they're lifted up off the ground, one kick can paralyze them if they don't have anything to kick against. So you can't let that back whiplash. So they have to be restrained. If they're a real flighty bunny, you know, you really have to make sure they can't squirt out of your arms, especially once they're up off the ground if you're carrying them. You don't want them to fall awkwardly. Even rabbits that you've owned for a long time and are not flighty bunnies, you really have to be constantly conscious of holding them securely because they're still an herbivore that has the instinct to, if something funny happens that startles them, they'll go, you know, without thinking. They may not be uncomfortable with you, but we had one while back, this five-year-old rabbit, owners that had it his whole life, door slammed while he's holding it. He was holding it casually. It leaped out of his arms, broke his back, was paralyzed, and put it asleep just from that. And again, because he was holding it kind of casually because he trusted the bunny and the bunny trusted him, but you know what? You interject a sudden noise or something there and all that changes and all of a sudden they have an animal with a permanent paralysis, you know. So you really don't want that. So you always have to kind of only half trust that they're, you know, have them gripped in such a way where they just can't get out of your arms with a big leap. Um, and if they're really, if somebody's not really experienced handling or if the bunny is got a history of being flighty, big towel might be a good way to hold them instead of just holding them barehanded. They can't kick you through a towel very well and it really does secure them pretty well and just the head sticking out. Everything else is bundled up where they really can't go. Uh, you know, we deal with a lot of bunnies in our practice that are nervous because they're in the practice and they don't know us. So even if they're nice bunnies, we never trust that they're going to not try to leap or do something. So, if, and, and one of the things bunnies like to do is, especially if they're eager to get away from you, is they want to go back to where it's safe, which may just be their cage. But, you know, if they see that's where they're going, they often try to get there quicker. And so you're like three feet away and they're trying to leap to the cage while you're not even that close. So we always try to blind them when they're coming to the cage, whether it's just a hand over their eyes or a towel over their eyes. If they're flighty at all, we have them where they can't tell where they are until they're set down. And they won't try to go if they can't see where they're going. So sometimes just blinding a bunny, as long as you're not having to have access to their head, like checking their mouth or something, then obviously you have to have them uncovered. But if you're just hauling them around somewhere, covering their head up is a great way to not have them try to take off on you. They feel kind of safe and sheltered, but they also can't see a darn thing. They have no idea where they'd be going, and they don't usually try to go if they can't see a, a destination. So, uh, but yeah, picking them up, just I can show you, but basically that's the key thing, is keeping those back legs from kicking. And if you're not comfortable with them, you think they're not trustworthy, you get a big towel around them, just pick them up within the towel and get them bundled up. And that's a pretty safe way, and you also want to put, you know, little marks from it. <laughs> but in the exam room, I can't have them all bundled up on the table usually. I mean, a flat towel, and we're trying to look at them. So if one of them takes me really by surprise, which is a little unusual, but I mean, it did. It was sitting there nice and quiet, also just did a panic bolt, and I just had to grab it and hold it down so I could get better control of it. And it actually kicked me up pretty well by the time I was done getting it settled down. I actually had two scratches, and one of them shallow enough to do me a scar, the other one did. But it had good, nice back leg strength. It can really give you a good kick. So. Yeah. What about the hearts in all the Well, they can get heart disease, like pretty much every every species of mammal I've seen, not including the reptiles here, because they're a little different, but every species of mammal I've seen gets heart diseases, uh, usually cardiomyopathies, which means it's not the human kind of cholesterol thing, where you actually technically that's not even a heart problem, it's an artery problem, you clog arteries. 
um, then the heart suffers because you don't have any blood. But basically, these are more degenerative diseases of the heart itself. The arteries are clear, they don't have cholesterol problems in rabbits. But the heart itself can gradually deteriorate and get an enlarged heart and have a failing heart. Um, they're not super common problems in rabbits, but we do see them. And in theory, if you had a highly stressed animal with heart rates through the roof or something, you know, your hand limb or something, and you had a heart problem there already, I suppose at that point it could act up, although most of the time it's not that, that sudden thing. It's usually not the rabbit keeled over suddenly, it's more, it's either slowing down, they're having trouble breathing, they're you know, showing other signs of heart disease, it's usually a gradual thing. But any older bunny, it's other thing related to old age. If you're handling an older bunny that's very flighty, maybe it was just captured from the golf course or something, for some reason you think it's an older rabbit, or maybe it's one you've had in, you know, here forever, or in your facility you couldn't find a home for it because it's really flighty or aggressive or something, but you know it's an older bunny. If they're high-stress animals that are older, they're probably a little more tweaky than a high-stress animal that's only one year old. So I mean, you have to handle them with care. They're, they can stress themselves out more easily, and, and then heart issues could be one hidden thing you might not know was there. Uh, if they're not in heart failure, you'd have no idea that heart problem. That's one thing about heart disease, both humans and animals. Unless you have symptoms, which means something's really wrong now, you may not know you have a heart problem for a long time. It's just kind of doing its job well enough you don't feel anything. And so, you an animal with cardiomyopathy, I might listen, that's one thing we're doing on an exam, is trying to listen for heart problems. Do they have a murmur, which most owners wouldn't know, they're not listening to their heart. Does, is the rhythm disturbed, where instead of having a nice normal beat, it's kind of going, you know, this, you'll get some bunnies that have, when they get bad heart disease, they're pumping blood well enough so they're staying conscious and doing everything, but you listen to the rhythm, it's all erratic. I mean, they'll have like a run of really fast beats, then they'll slow down, and they'll have some slow beats or skip beats, then they'll go fast again. That's never normal, it should be pretty much like a metronome speeds up when they're excited a little bit, but the rate is usually very steady. And you get hearts that are skipping all over the place, that's a bad heart. And the concern is, will it sometimes just decide to stop? And you have an erratic beat that gets to the point where it just stops all of a sudden and they just crash. Um, is there so, medication? Yeah, I mean, basically, if you have a heart problem, you recognize it, you know, especially while they're still stable and they haven't gone into failure yet. Um, you can oftentimes, you can't cure heart disease in most cases, but you can certainly do things that make it better or slow down the rate of deterioration. The problem with muscle disease in hearts is no one really knows in most cases why they happen in the first place. So it's hard to cure something when you don't know the cause. I mean, cardiomyopathy is just kind of a lump sum term that means the muscles degenerate. But why? That's the big question. I mean, in humans, some of those cases, they never figure out why. Other cases, like my uncle, uh, normal heart, got a bad viral infection, didn't take enough rest off work, and kind of kept pushing himself while he had the infection, so the virus hung on and hung on, infected his heart muscle, and caused a major damage to his heart, and he was dead a year and a half later of advanced heart disease. So viral cardiomyopathies happen in humans where the virus infects your heart and actually damages the muscle. And a few months later, you've got a massively enlarged heart that's failing. And you're actually normal up till then. Viral disease can do that if you don't take care of yourself. So one reason to be careful and baby yourself when you've got flu virus and stuff, they will attack your heart muscle if they hang around long enough occasionally. My uncle had that happen. That's why he died young. So in rabbits and most other species, we really haven't ever documented that viral cardiomyopathies happen. We really don't know in most cases why they get a heart muscle disease. It's more common when they're older. But I have seen young ones with it too. So is there genetic aspects, nutritional, hereditary, yeah, who knows. Um, but you treat them, yeah, we can treat them and medicate and make them better a lot of times. Yeah? You don't have to worry about heartworm disease or no. rabies, right? Heartworm disease, rabies, I would say no, but technically, rabies virus is a really oddball virus in the sense that most viruses are very species specific, or maybe a few species, like swine flu can get to humans, and human flu, flu virus can get into ferrets and vice versa. But most viruses are pretty species specific. So one that affects a rat is not too likely to affect a cat and so on and so forth. Cats and dogs don't share much viral disease. Rabies is the one exception. It's a virus that technically they think can infect any warm-blooded mammal on the planet. Uh, but there's a great deal of difference in how susceptible they are to it, how easily they get it, and are they likely to get it. Herbivores just aren't as likely to pick it up because they're not biting and fighting for a living and stuff. Animals that are communal live in big groups like bats easily spread it among themselves, even just through aerosolized urine, just from inhaling it. So bats are a big host anyway. They carry it a long time before they die, so they're great hosts because they don't kill them quick. They can spread it and live a long time. Foxes and um, um, bats and uh, skunks are species that can get it pretty easily and live quite a while with it, which makes them good hosts. Ferrets get rabies viruses like dogs and cats do, but ferrets are mostly dead-end hosts. They don't get it as easily. They said that in one study, it took 50,000 times the amount of virus injected into a ferret in terms of numbers of virus particles. Now, how they counted that, I don't know, but they said it really took 50,000 times the dose to infect the ferret as it does to infect the fox. Foxes are much more susceptible. 
Once ferrets get it, the other interesting thing is they don't shed it in their saliva, which means they're a dead-end host. They can't bite somebody and spread it that way, except we found one strain of raccoon rabies, because uh, they call these things strange because it likes raccoons better. One strain of raccoon rabies that actually did produce low viral shedding in the ferret's saliva. So they still don't, you don't want to get bitten by a rabid ferret, but if you had to pick a rabid animal to get bitten by, a ferret's a good one, because 95% of the time you're probably not going to get the virus from them because they don't have it in their saliva, they're a dead-end host. So the virus is capable of infecting a lot of different species. If you inoculated a rabbit with live rabies virus, it would probably die of rabies eventually. It would probably get it. But they're almost never going to get exposed. Let's say you get in a fight with a rabid raccoon or something outdoors. They're in a hut, so the raccoon gets in there and tears them up, but they live. There's a small chance of rabies exposure if the animal is rabid. I don't know that anybody's ever even documented a case in, in rabbits, but herbivores can get it. There's cattle cases reported occasionally where cattle came down with rabies because they got bitten by a, a bat outdoors or some kind of wildlife animal. Maybe it was a fox or skunk or something, and you know somehow bit them on the leg or bit them on their back or something. And cattle that are outdoors all the time, they do have some exposure. There've been more than one case of cattle getting rabies, and of course, getting rabies, and um, of course, humans can get it. And so, yeah, technically, they probably can. Would you expect to ever see it? No. And there's no approved vaccine for it in cat rabbits, so you couldn't vaccine it for you if you wanted to. So you just say, no, that's not a thing. We, we don't think much about it. And those little reports just usually assume that's never going to be an issue. And heartworms are not an issue? The heartworms are not an issue either. It's, a, it's somewhat species specific. It's really a dog disease. Well, dogs and dog like animals. So coyotes, wolves, those kind of animals get it. Uh, and other carnivores like cats and ferrets can get it, but they get it really seldom. They don't get, they're not very susceptible. Even if they get mosquito bit a lot, the once in a great while report a case in a cat or a, rat, uh, a ferret. And again, no case in herbivores I've ever heard of being reported, no matter if they're outdoors or not. So it's not a big disease in those species yet. People who own pet skunks, um, mm -hmm. sorry, it's a rabbit thing, but do they have to get rabies shots then? There's no approved rabies vaccine for a skunk. It would be nice to have a rabies vaccine approved for a skunk, and probably the one we use in ferrets, which is one of the dog ones, probably works just fine in a skunk, but probably isn't good enough for the government to say they're rabies immunized. And because it's a human disease and fatal, they really want proof of, that it works, whereas if it's distemper, they wouldn't care, go ahead and vaccinate. We do vaccinate for, uh, skunks for dog distemper because they're susceptible, and no one really worries about if there's been a lot of studies proving it's safe and effective. We know they're susceptible to distemper. It's a much more common virus in Oregon than rabies is. The skunk goes outside. I worry about distemper exposure, not rabies as much. But we do really caution clients to keep their skunks away from situations where they might encounter wildlife. Don't leave the skunk out in the backyard all day and night where a wild skunk or a wild raccoon might come in and mix it up with them. We don't want to take a chance in getting exposed because we have no way of, for sure, immunizing them that we know works. It probably works, but eh, that nobody would want to trust that. And so because skunks are so susceptible, you really need them as an indoor pet. And if you're outdoors, you know, they're outdoors, they're on a leash or a harness with you with them where you control their exposure. They're not going to get it from walking on the ground. The virus is a real fragile virus. It has to go from animal to animal pretty much. It won't live out in the open ground long. So you're not going to pick it up from walking out there where some other raccoon or skunk have been. You've got to get bitten by an animal or have close contact. Uh, maybe drinking out of an outside water bowl that another, a rabbit animal had just drunk out of because it's saliva transmitted. Virus can live for a day or so in moist situations. So you really wouldn't want a water bowl out in that port that wildlife can drink from and then your animal drinks from it, that might possibly expose you. Pet skunks are, you know, we see them, and they're all from rabies-free breeder facilities. They have to come from, to be legal, they have to come from, there's a facility back in New York, they breed them indoors, they've been tested and proven rabies-free, and those are animals, the only animals that are allowed to be sold as, as pets. They're not somebody that found a baby skunk on the side of the road and wants to keep it a pet. They, they don't come in my building. For one thing, they're not descended. They're not coming in, they're not coming in the room because they're going to let it loose as soon as you know. No. And second thing is, uh, they, they, they're not legal pet. They're not, they're native wildlife. They're not one that came from breeder facilities. They have, the rabies issue is always a concern with those. And you need to make sure they came from the right facility. Papers from the Department of Agriculture saying they are from a rabies free breeder. And then you make sure they keep them indoors and don't get silly with them. Um, the best you can do. Yeah. But have an elderly female rabbit who is have serious illness, but she's incontinent okay. or else squatting. So she has a wet yellow bottom all the time, yeah. but she doesn't seem to be able to clean. Should we try to clean that? And if so, you, how? Well? Yeah, the two things. One is you might be able to stop the incontinence. If, again, it depends on what's causing it. There might be things we can do to actually make that go away. But to clean it, basically, 
probably the simplest thing, you don't have to bathe the whole bunny. If you only got one area that needs it. So we typically just hold them up vertical, you know, because they, they don't mind that usually. You get them up vertical against you, get that rear end kind of pushed out a little bit, and just stick it under running warm water, water. comfortably warm, and just rinse and rinse and rinse till it looks clean. Try to pat it just plain water. You can use a little bit of mild pet shampoo, but a lot of times you just get it under running water and let it run for a little bit. You don't have to literally do a lot of handling and scrubbing, especially the skin sensitive. Just let it run and get it clean enough, then pat it dry, and then, you know, try to keep her on absorbent bedding. But those are things that sometimes are unfixable, other times we can actually do something to make that better. It's, the things you're worried about there are, do you have something like arthritic changes in the back, do you have some pressure on the spinal nerves, which is making that bladder control weaker, in which case an anti-inflammatory drug might help, or is it encephalozoan up in the brain, which often seems to mess with their urinary control, you treat that, suppress that parasite, sometimes the urinary control miraculously comes back, and all of a sudden people are like, yeah, they're not soiling anymore, they're dry again. So there's sometimes things you can do for that to fix it. If not, you just keep it clean by yeah, getting the rear end under water, rinse and rinse. Almost a daily thing, though, if they're getting messy. You know. Our rabbit came upon it with his uh, front teeth original, hmm. and he couldn't clean himself. So. Yeah, any, any, yeah, any, any, any interference with grooming can make it worse, too. Yeah. yeah, she's old. Good question. Okay. The eye discharge, yeah. I mean, you try to get the eye discharge resolved if you can, but some of them are really hard to get cleared up. But otherwise, you just have to keep the skin as clean as you can, even just a wet cloth trying to gently wipe it clean. And sometimes, sometimes they'll they'll kind of the hair it'll get irritated enough the hair just falls out and have a bald patch, which actually makes it better for a while because then it dries out, it's easier to keep it clean. But then if it gets better, the hair wants to try to regrow. Some bad ones we just end up shaving the little area to make it bald if they haven't gone bald on their own, just because it makes it easier to keep it clean, so the skin's not always infected and angry. Uh, but more normally it's just a matter of trying to manually keep it clean best you can. A wet cloth, whatever it is. Depending on how bad they are, sometimes a little bit of, uh, even just like a little tiny bit of Vaseline on there just because it repels water. Mm -hmm. But you know, most of the time we're trying to see if we can get the eye discharge to stop. There's cases where we can't, so there's cases where it's going to be kind of permanent. Uh, but if we can get the eye discharge cleared up, then they're back to being low maintenance again. Otherwise, it's a matter of just trying to keep it physically clean and once in a while shaving it. So that was kind of going to be one of my questions. I have a bunny that I adopted about four years ago, uh -huh. and they, I was told that he had um, snuffles. Okay, yeah. And he's been on rounds and rounds of antibiotics, and now he's six years old, mm -hmm. and he's starting to get really congested, and his eye discharge. So I knows, yeah. What can I do? Well, the thing is, too, is, of course, it's not a curable disease. You can make the symptoms so go he away. Could, I was like, well, if they're wrong, like, so he could live that long. He yeah. could live for six years. A lot of rabbits with respiratory disease, and I can't, and the thing is, too, is there's more than one kind of infection that causes that, so I can't tell you which one it is. Yeah. One study actually shows staph's the most common, not pastorella. The pastorella is a close second. Uh, but it's usually one of those two bugs. They're, neither of them are curable. I mean, if they have that, they have their whole life. And you can have a rabbit that carries one of those bugs their whole life, has no symptoms at all. It can be totally non symptomatic if they control it well. But again, geriatric disease, you're more likely to see stuff get worse when they get older because they can't control them as well. Mm -hmm. But the science of that can vary from severe pneumonia all the way down and occasional eye discharge or nasal discharge. It's really not dangerous. My tendency is I don't treat them aggressively with antibiotics if the signs are really mild because all you're going to get is drug resistance built up. And you really didn't compass that much. You made a mild discharge go away. If it's mild, I might use eye drops on them to save the big guns for later on in life when they get worse. Depending on how many times he's been on drugs and which one he's been on, you may have bugs there now that don't respond to those antibiotics anymore, and it may be harder to control than it once was. Uh, it, but again, I'd have to know which drugs he was on and how many times, and sometimes the common drugs still work, depending on what it is. Are you going to cure it? No, but you ought to be able to make the signs a lot better. You ought to be able to clear up, this, especially if you start getting nasal congestion, which can make it hard to breathe. If it's getting significant, I'd worry about that more than a little bit of tearing from the eyes, so you might have to treat that. But it could be a combination of eye and nose drops, maybe a different oral antibiotic or slightly higher dose. Uh, you may need to treat it for a month straight to get it cleared up too, not just a week. So, I mean, it may take a while. Rabbits don't have good immune systems as a species, even when they're young. I mean, compared to a dog or a cat, rabbits have crummy immune systems. I mean, they're like a cat with FIV. If you get a cat with feline immunodeficiency virus, they're kind of like rabbits. They have about the same immune competence, you know, which is kind of enough to get along, but not great. So if you give them a bacterial bug, they sometimes don't fight it very well and it takes a lot longer to get it cleared up and you treat it. That's why we hate abscesses in rabbits. If you get an abscess on a cat, you lance that thing one time, put them on even a wimpy antibiotic like amoxicillin, it's going to go away within a week, I mean, every time. And unless the cat's got an immune deficiency virus, then they take forever to heal, just like rabbits. So rabbits and most herbivores, 
they don't need good immune systems in their wild settings because number one, they don't live very long, not supposed to live very long, and secondly, they don't fight for a living. They don't need to survive wounds repeatedly and things like this. You look at a dog or a cat, you know, carnivores lead a rough lifestyle, and even though they may win when they go hunting, the things they're eating really aren't happy about being dinner usually, and so you know they're going to get bitten, they're getting scratched, they're going to, you know, there's going to be stuff happening. Even a rat, I mean, it can give a nasty bite. If you get an animal like a cat tackling a rat, rats can bite and they can give you deep, nasty bite wounds with nasty bacteria on those teeth. If you're going to be a successful carnivore, you can't die of an abscess the first time you hunt and something fights back, and that's not going to be a successful carnivore. You have to have a really good immune system. Nobody's going to help you out there. Um, also, carnivores tend to be very territorial, whether it's a wolf pack in a big territory or a cat defi defending its, you know, uh, half a square block territory. Cats like to fight in their outdoors because they have territories. and. If you're going to be a carnivore, you have to have an area that's your area to eat because there's, it takes a lot of herbivores to feed one carnivore. So you have to have plenty of field mice and stuff out there. You can't have other carnivores coming in and lunching on your you know, menu. So basically, carnivores tend to fight with each other more than herbivores also because they're defending territory and all that stuff. So you get cat scraps and bite wounds and stuff. And again, but you have to be able to heal from those with nobody helping you. And you've got to live long enough, if you're a carnivore, to have successful reproduction. And they don't breed as fast and heavy as the herbivores do. So you have to be around for a few years at least to get you know, successful litters out there. If you're an herbivore and you're two years old, there's probably four other generations at least of rabbits already competing for you, you know, if they haven't died of other causes. And the older animals are starting to become actually a negative thing because they're not quite as fertile, they're not quite as young and healthy, but they're competing for food and space with all the younger animals. So in nature, it doesn't do the rabbit population any good to have animals live to be seven years old. You'd overpopulate, but also these older animals are less fertile, they're just taking up space. So nature's design, unfortunately, is these guys are supposed to be gone in a couple years. You know, it's not supposed to be very long. So to live a couple years while you're young and strong and you're avoiding traumas, you don't need a very good immune system. You just need enough to kind of get by for that period of time. And that's what they got. If you're a cat, you're going to be out there competing, or a dog, you better have a pretty good immune system, and that's why they do. And so. One of the common misconceptions of people, veterinarians included, who work just on dogs and cats, is that animals have great immune systems. No, carnivores have great immune systems. Herbivores have crummy immune systems compared to us. I mean, we're much better off than they are. And so that's one of the things that makes us have a hard time dealing with infections, and, and including respiratory disease, is that a cat with pastorella virtually never gets sick from it. All cats have pastorella in their mouths. The only time it causes problems is when they stink it into somebody else's tissue and you get an abscess. And even then, it's really easy to heal it. Rabbits don't tolerate pastoral very well because they can't control the bug as well. They have a harder time suppressing it and getting rid of it. And so it's a big problem for rabbits much more than cats. So it's probably treatable. It's probably, you can probably get a lot of improvement. You'll always be, this kid will always be carrying that bug. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's getting enough to where you're starting to see some significant respiratory disease, not just little eye goobers or occasional little wet nose, you probably have to treat it. How old now is this? Six, yeah. So he's also getting to an age where he probably is going to need help more than a one-year-old would just because that's the age he is. He's getting to where he can't control things as well. Um, yeah, so probably he needs treatment, but again, the best choice of treatment, if it's a first-time case, I just pick an antibiotic that usually works well and they tolerate well. But if previous treatments have included those drugs, especially if you thought, you know what, the last time we used that drug didn't work very well, I might not just automatically repeat that drug, whether even if it's something good like Batril, I might have to go to something different. Find something the bugs that are not used to that still doesn't upset his gut too much, but causes the bugs to die back better. He'll still be a carrier, but those are cases sometimes we do have to jump in and treat him. I'm not really gung ho about treating young rabbits with mild signs. You know, if you could cure them, sure, treat them one time, they're gone the rest of their life, that'd be great. The rabbits and rats with respiratory disease, you really almost never cure those, and so you're trying to just keep them as healthy as you can with as little drugs as you have to use. Partially because it upsets their gut sometimes, and partially because why over treat them? They're going to have this disease when they're old timers, and that's when they really get the bad pneumonia sometimes when they're old. So I don't want to treat them five times before the age of one year because that just means they're going to have a harder time when they're older getting rid of this stuff. So, any other questions? Yeah. My rabbit bob back and forth. Is that something that should be looked at? Always done that? I don't know. Someone here saw it, so. I mean, if he's always done that kind of scanning type behavior, it may just be him. It's peculiar, it's technically not a totally normal behavior, but you have certain individuals, and I've seen other species too, that tend to have a little kind of a scanning behavior, and then they walk around fine, they're not off balance and falling over or anything, they don't have a head tilt, but they kind of have a scanning thing they do, and they've done it most of their life. That's probably something you just live with, you can't fix that. If it's something brand new and get the horse wrapped, they'd be more worried about something going on the brain. Yeah? Would you look at it? 
I'm sorry. I have I have a scanner I got. Um, she's uh, let's see, she's probably about four or five now. Okay. <clears throat> Always done it? <clears throat> yeah, and she was really yeah. teeny when I got her. I got her from here. Yeah. And she was malnourished and I had a vet say that mm -hmm, something's not right right here. She 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 scans her head from side to side. Yeah. Um, I had a bunch of tests run, you know, she seems to be Okay. And she's gotten her weight back up and looks good oh, since then, yeah. 100% healthy. Um, she's got a, a, a mate now that um, she's had for a few years. And uh, yeah. he tolerates her. Uh, she eats, she hops around, she's doing everything else that's normal. Yeah, she's probably always going to do it and it probably won't ever be a problem. Yeah, it's, just, you know, it's obviously not a brain tumor or something like that. It's if, if I'd seen one that was really, like, say, kind of wasted away or underweight or looked unthrifty and was doing it as a baby, then I would worry about a bacterial infection or maybe a cephalozoan. But, you know, when you get past that and they're looking good in other ways and they just keep doing the scanning, it's probably a lifelong thing. It's probably hereditary. I mean, that's, that's a good explanation. Because you'll see them do it from birth, literally, sometimes. They do it, at least once they're big enough to walk around. And they do it their whole life and it never seems to bother them. It's like, okay. I've had a bit tell me to watch the eyes. But that's not what's causing the scanning, though. I mean, I'd be worried if she suddenly started having nystagmus and the eyes were jerking like crazy and she oh, was no. suddenly much worse or had a head tilt. But that scanning behavior is an interesting thing, and I've yeah. never seen any definitive description of exactly why it occurs, but you see it in more than one species. It's uncommon. But most animals that have that scanning behavior seem to live normal lives. They just kind of can't keep their heads still. You know, it's like, okay, you live with that. And it's interesting, but probably not dangerous. So. They'd only be worried if it was something came on all of a sudden in old age. The changes are not what you want to see. But they've always kind of had a little bit of scanning. Yeah. I don't get very worried about that. Five-year-old bunny who's suddenly scanning like crazy and never did it before, I'd be worried about what's going on up here because that's, that's not normal. So depends on how often it's been, how long it's been going on. Yep. Um, how can you tell how old your bunny is? <laughs> Good question. Come see me. No, I won't be able to tell you either. <laughs> um, Aging rabbits and any herbivore is difficult because most of what we use to age, well, I shouldn't say any herbivores, to age horses by their teeth, but small herbivores. Um, very difficult to age them because a lot of what we use to age animals is their teeth, um, in dogs and cats and stuff, because when you have teeth like ours that don't grow all the time, it's stuff like wear and tear, you know, wearing on the enamel tells you something about their age, how much chipping and wear they have, and how much tartar they build up, like on dogs, how much gum disease. Because the enamel's just sitting there year after year, so it builds stuff up on it. You get teeth like rabbits that grow constantly. Technically, it's new enamel almost every month. Well, unless the teeth get diseased or crooked, those teeth look just as good when they're six years old as they do when they're one year old. There's nothing to age them by. All you can go by is just a general impression of how their body looks. Now, if they come in with uh, certain diseases, um, like guinea pigs with cystic ovaries, they just don't get those when they're young. We just had a guinea pig in for an exam. The owner thought, well, maybe it's a year old. I got palpating and she had two really big cystic ovaries. That probably places her as at least three or above because it's a middle-aged, older guinea pig disease. So if I find something specific that's more likely an old animal disease, I'll be more likely to say, hey, this kid's older. But you know, you get a bunny that's kept in poor conditions, looks really dirty and unkept, they always look older. You know, and you get them cleaned up and they're all pretty again, they look younger because their coat looks better. If they're obese, they tend to always look older in my eyes because I think usually older animals are more likely to be heavy. Plus, when they're obese, they can't groom very well. They can't turn around and reach all areas, so they tend to be more matted and dirty, and it's just, they just look older. But it doesn't mean they're older. You make a two-year-old rabbit really obese and dirty, they're going to look old. And you get them in shape and they're back to grooming, well, gee, they look kind of younger. But, you know, you can't, they can't tell you. So unless you have a good history on them as to how old they were, or if the owners got them and they were this big and now they're this big, okay, we know they got them as a baby. But I'm usually relying on the owners to help with age because if there's no history on them, two-year-old and five-year-old don't look a lot different. It's really healthy. It's really hard to tell. So unfortunately, there is no great way to age them, really. I mean, uh, unless they're still growing, you know they're not very old. You know. Yeah. Do you have a really old rabbit that's on just small amount of Tennessee pellets and Tennessee hay? Yeah. And we tried to get them to mix it even with the old hay. Mm -hmm. And you know, it reminds me of the lady, he's got an attitude problem, right? He doesn't want to come out of his cage. Yeah. Like there. And we watch him pick the oat hay out yeah. of the Timothy and throw it on the ground. <laughs> and he would starve before he would eat it, I guess. Yeah, it's not critical to eat oat hay. Is there any oat hay, the other thing with oat hay is it's not as tasty. No, this isn't me saying this, this is the rabbit saying this. Uh, to me, it's a human, they'd all probably taste like, you know, straw. I mean, they're, you know, not tasty to us. But you look at it, I mean, oat hay is 
more coarse, it looks more like straw, it's not just this nice green. You know, you look at other grass hays like orchard grass and timothy hay, they just look greener, fresher, they're, they're easier to eat, they're smaller. There's quite a few bunnies that if they're used to timothy or some other grass hay, they don't like oat hay. It's just, you know, other ones, the first time they see it, they're just eager to eat it like anything else, they're not picky. So I always say it's, it's worth a try, but if they'll eat timothy alone, that's fine. They don't have to eat oat hay, unless you have an animal that you think has a hay allergy, and I have, have seen animals with hay fever. In that case, if Timothy is the one that's causing allergy, we have to try to find another hay, ideally, to stop that. But if you got a guy that eats Timothy, great. That's a fine hay. If you won't eat the oat hay, you can't force them. And again, meadow grass hay is out there. It's not quite as low in protein. It's certainly not as low as oat hay, but it's actually okay. It's not real high. I would just try to minimize the orchard grass. It would be better to go Timothy than do orchard, orchard grass mixed in. I wouldn't bother with that. So Timothy alone, or maybe you could try, if you can find meadow grass hay, you can do a little bit of that. Um, See, you had told me that you have to eat the oat hay because of his urine. Yeah, if you won't eat it, it doesn't work. In that case, if you're using it for medical reasons, that's the one time, and again, we've got to be careful about it, it's the one time you might put orchard grass in there because it's lower than calcium than Timothy hay. Of, of the grass hays, Timothy is actually one of the highest calcium grass hays. It's not as high as alfalfa, but that's not a grass. But of the grass hays, Timothy is a very high calcium hay. So, orchard grass is about 25 to 30% lower in calcium. Now, oat hay is 25 to 30% lower than orchard grass, so it's still twice as good. But if they won't eat it, it's not as good. They'll eat orchard grass almost certainly. It's a rich hay, it looks a lot like Timothy, he'll probably like it. The thing is, can we keep him from gaining weight or having gut upsets on it? And usually what you have to do to switch to orchard grass, especially if they're old, is you've got to cut most of their pellet out. I mean, maybe he's just getting a teaspoon of pellets a day, just enough for some vitamin and mineral content. But when you take most of the pellet away, you're taking a lot of protein away. Now the higher protein hay just balances out what you took away. They're not going to get obese. It's just like you're replacing the pellets with the hay. But it's a lower, lower calcium source than the pellet. So you can do that if you're very careful to restrict those pellets down to what looks like an absurdly small amount. Whereas with oat hay, you can just do what you normally do. Feed a ton of hay, let me use pellets. You wouldn't have to worry about restricting the pellet. You go to orchard grass, you'll probably like it, but you've got to restrict the pellet way down to very small amounts. And do a gradual, do a gradual switch. I don't worry about just throwing oat hay in or timothy, but if you're putting orchard grass in, it's a richer hay, don't just change it one day to that hay. Mix it gradually with the timothy hay and gradually reduce timothy hay down so it's a slow switch. Anytime you're enriching the diet, it's a richer thing. Don't just throw it in there and hope you can tolerate it. Do it slowly. Make sure he's not getting diarrhea or anything like that. But yeah, if you want to eat oat hay, you're kind of stuck. You just won't eat it. You can't force it. Whereas rabbits, it's mostly just the cats we worry about as companions. Dogs are not as likely to give them stuff as much. 
So you know, depending on species, the, the risk change. The only advantage guinea pigs have is we can vaccinate them for Bordetella. We can actually immunize them against it. We know they're going to be around dogs or a rabbit or something. There's actually a vaccine that's safe and effective in guinea pigs. The problem with rabbits is we don't have any Pastorella vaccine. They have been made in the past. They've been made in small batches for specific rabbit trees by a vaccine maker, you know, just as a, just for their strain of Pastorella kind of thing. It was never commercially marketed to the general public. So there's never been a widespread available Pastorella vaccine, even though they have made successful batches on small levels for breeders where they were just having a terrible time with it in their breeder facility. And they, they, rather than just getting rid of all the rabbits starting over, they, they have a vaccine actually made for them. It cost money to do it, but they did. And it knocked it down and made it more immune. So it's possible to make vaccine for Pastorella and rabbits, but it's a, you know, Somebody has to be willing to spend the money to do it, develop it, and market it, and that's not likely to happen anytime soon. So we don't have one. The only reason we have one for guinea pigs is because one of the dog vaccines turns out to work well in guinea pigs, or a couple of them actually do. You have to be really careful with it, but as to which one you use. You give the guinea pig the wrong Bordetella vaccine, it will give them pneumonia. It can kill them. So it has to be a kill vaccine, not a live. It can't be a live vaccine. Right. And most dog vaccines are live vaccines. They work a little better. But there's an old brand called Bronchocene that's been around forever that they killed Bordetella vaccine, but cannot give the guinea pig Bordetella. That one actually is safe and effective. But since we don't that vaccinate dogs with Castor Pastorella, there's no other vaccine we can adapt for rabbits. It would have to be one made specifically for rabbits. No one's going to do that anytime soon because it costs big bucks to do it. And But it's possible to do it. It's just, who knows when it will happen. Yeah. How exactly is Pastorella transmitted from cats to rabbits? Is it just through the saliva, like just through water? The saliva is the slightest easiest way. I mean, saliva is the easiest way, but if the cat sneezes, it can certainly, just like the respiratory people, it can be airborne and little water droplets briefly, it still survives quite well. In fact, being a bacteria, it's more hardy than viruses. It's less likely to die quickly if it's out of the body for a few minutes. It's less sensitive to UV light, it's less sensitive to dry. <coughs> bacteria is still hardier than viruses, usually, most viruses. So, basically, yeah, if they have, if the cat only comes in the rabbit's room and never gets within 10 feet of the rabbit, it's very unlikely to go spread anything. If they come up and sniff noses through the cage, the cat can either directly touch noses or lick on the rabbit, or the cat sneezes when it's close to the rabbit within you know, a short distance, then airborne transmission. Certainly if the rabbit gets out in the house and sometimes drinks from the cat's water bowl, cats can be depositing you know, pastoral in there from the slide when it drinks and live in the water for a while. It's an easy way to be water bowl. Even if they never allow to touch each other, the water bowl would be a big source. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's contagious enough, rabbits are susceptible to it, that you really would have to be careful with other animals' household that they don't really interact with the rabbit in any kind of substantive way. They don't share water bowls, they don't get within six feet of each other. You know, there's ways you can prevent exposure, you can definitely have rabbits and cats in the same house, but if you really don't want to get in pastorella, you better be careful about that kind of contact, yeah. So I can't prevent the disease, they get it, they got it, and then you just hope they don't get sick from it. <laughs>